Okay. Um, we were doing Aristotle yesterday, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, we stopped uh, with uh, the idea of uh, we stopped with uh, the, the idea of his various books. Um, uh, and his uh, uh, mode of imparting education, which I told you is peripatetic. And peripatetic uh, means that uh, you walk while you teach. Uh, so you don't really have any kind of a building in which you sit and impart uh, education. Uh, and I told you that Aristotle did not author uh, even uh, one of the books that are credited to him, uh, though they are all his ideas. The ideas are all his, without doubt. Uh, but then there is that interpretation element that comes in because of the fact that it is the students who are uh, actually, uh, what should I say? The students are the ones who are uh, looking at um, uh, the ideas of his, not looking, they're remembering the ideas of his as they discussed while they were uh, under, actually in the uh, uh, peripatetic class. And I told you Lyceum is not a name for his school. Lyceum means peripatetic. So um, those are all uh, generic names. Uh, so, what you do find is that uh, Aristotle is uh, actually uh, teaching and uh, various people are, they divide, they have divided themselves into groups. Uh, his students and uh, they uh, later on wrote down his teachings for the sake of posterity so that the posterity uh, will uh, know what Aristotle's ideas were. There is also <clears throat> the debate about uh, Aristotle versus Plato. Uh, it's not really much of a debate in itself because there is no doubt that uh, Aristotle did not really see eye to eye with Plato on most issues because Plato's uh, derivations, Plato's idea of uh, how to construct a world, uh, all that came from mathematics and specifically geometry. But uh, Aristotle, for some reason, is Jews. Uh, mathematics uh, I made this observation yesterday where I told you that you'll find him being mentioned in botany, zoology, everywhere except for perhaps in mathematics. Uh, 
what people have tried to show is this is where the debate comes in. Uh, a debate is always something which is in the nature of a controversy. And uh, in the case of some of the interpretations of Aristotle and Plato, people have interpreted them as adversaries. Okay, uh, by this I don't mean the students who wrote down his uh, uh, ideas, uh, which do become some kind of interpretations in themselves. I'm not talking about that part. Uh, the part that I'm talking about is the part that deals with uh, Aristotle uh, and Plato. Uh, being uh, the opposites of each other. Now that is the debate which has come up in later times, especially in a modern period. Uh, because if you look at the medieval period, the Christian thinkers, they favored both Plato and they favored uh, Aristotle as well. Uh, so they were not uh, trying to see them as opposite categories. This thing comes in much later. Uh, it comes in the modern period and in the modern period people have seen Plato as a as an idealist and Aristotle as a realist and while talking to you about uh, while talking to you about uh, the painting of Raphael uh, of the Renaissance period, it shows uh, Plato gazing at the stars uh, and Aristotle gazing at the ground or the earth. Uh, now that in itself doesn't mean anything. It really, again, most paintings are subject to interpretation. So it is something that has been interpreted as idealist versus realist uh, in the 20th century post the Second World War. Uh, so that is not a sustainable, uh, it isn't a sustainable uh, kind of a, uh, what should I say, a division. Uh, because Aristotle is not a realist in uh, the international sen uh, relations sense of the term. A realist there is the opposite of an idealist who is one who looks at the global community as one community. And uh, uh, a realist is one who looks at uh, national interest as the primary thing. That is what guides the behavior of a particular country. So that kind of... Uh, uh, that kind of, uh, uh, what should I say, uh, interpretation is unacceptable. Okay, so this, this is not acceptable.
that Plato is an idealist and Aristotle is a realist. Now, I'll go on to explain why. But first and foremost, the main reason is that this is a vocabulary with which neither Plato nor Aristotle uh, is familiar with. So this vocabulary of idealism versus realism. So therefore that is not acceptable. Then there is another interpretation which says Plato is, uh, sees Plato as an idealist and Aristotle as a, or rather an empiricist. These people claim that Aristotle studied some 169 or 159 odd uh, constitutions before he came to a conclusion about what would be the best possible state, they say, that again is a wrong word. You cannot use the word state in the context of, uh, <clears throat> uh, in the context of Aristotle. Okay. Um, it is really not something that uh, you can, because um, at that time, there were no states as we know them. What they were were the police, P-O-L-I-L-E-I-S, police, that is the Greek pronunciation, which is the plural for the polis. Okay, so that is again uh, something that uh, we should remember that there is no talk of state. Uh, a republic in the case of Plato, yes. But in the case of Aristotle, he's talking about the best possible polis. And uh, in fact, the whole vocabulary of politics is something that should be attributed to Aristotle. And we'll come to that point uh, in a while as we go ahead. Now, is Aristotle an empiricist? The answer to that is a no. Because first and foremost, what are these 169 or 159 uh, political groupings, let's simply call them that. And did they have any written constitutions? Is that the time when people had written constitutions? Because please remember, written constitution is something which happened in the post-social contractualist era. Okay, uh, that is when the written constitution comes into being. Um, otherwise, um, there never really was a written constitution, so to speak. Okay, so what we need to look at then is, is Aristotle an empiricist? The answer to that is again, No. So this idea that Plato is an idealist and Aristotle is an empiricist is also
we'll have to get into one particular point here. Empiricism is not normative. Okay, empiricism is not normative. Whereas Aristotelian thinking, philosophy, is most definitely normative. Okay. So now let us try to understand. Our, now that we've established this, let's try and ask ourselves a question. The question that we ask ourselves is, is, is uh, Aristotle is his philosophy, if not in these terms, terms as idealist versus realist, or idealist versus empiricist, if not in these terms, is he the complete opposite of Plato? Okay, uh, please remember that most of us are informed by that painting of Raphael, okay, uh, which shows one as a stargazer, and in that sense, somebody who's looking at probably the unreachable, because stars are unreachable. Uh, and uh, if you're looking at Aristotle, and if he's looking down at the ground, uh, does that mean that uh, he is doing, uh, he's talking about something which is reachable? And therefore, is he really acceptable? Is, is he really the opposite, sorry, of uh, Plato? Now, I would say that whatever the motivations of Raphael, Raphael has unfortunately created, uh, no, uh, Raphael has created an unfortunate situation wherein he has, uh, what should I say, uh, portrayed these people, these two philosophers as being opposites of each other. They have been portrayed as opposites of each other. Uh, well, a painter has a license to do that, but as students of political science and political philosophy, we don't have the license that a painter or a poet or any artist, that's called artistic license. So we don't have an artistic license to interpret people in ways that we think is right. We have to be a lot more careful. We have to pay a great deal more uh, attention to this uh, whole idea that you find in 
these two thinkers, the ideas that we find in these two thinkers. And if you look at them, if you look at them, you will find that surprisingly enough, Aristotle is more normative than Plato, which is a point that most number of people who make a comparison between Plato and Aristotle, they totally miss this point out that Plato is not, <laughs> shut up, Plato is not as normative as Aristotle is. If you look at his entire schemata of reaching the ideal republic. Now, first of all, let's ask ourselves this question. In Plato, who is setting the goal for the ideal republic? Who's setting the goal? The goal for the ideal republic in Plato is being set up by Plato himself. Who has decided what will be the components of the ideal republic? It's Plato himself. Well, you may say that these things which he has considered as good and some of the things that he has considered as bad, those are also normative. Definitely, yes, they are normative. But the normative part of it of uh, his philosophy is something that is being attributed technically it is being attributed to this parts that he's talking about okay and he is not looking at somebody else setting the goals of what the ideal republic is and what the ideal is as opposed to uh, what is not the ideal. So the ideal being the real, which we find in the uh, allegory of the cave where people confuse the shadows of objects for objects themselves and look at the actual and think that the actual is the real, that is the bit that is the most interesting in Plato. So that is not normative. That is not at all normative. Okay, so Plato is not putting up goals which are unrealizable. If you say Plato's goals are unrealizable, then I guess you'll have to say that of every philosopher, of every philosopher, with the exception perhaps of people like uh, John Locke, who were in a large measure able to achieve what they set out for and what they set out doing. With the exception of one or two people like that, most philosophers will be considered to be, 
to have espoused systems of thought that are unrealistic because they haven't taken the shape that is expected of them. Uh, or rather the reality didn't shape take the shape that the philosophy expected to set up. So you see, so Plato is normative to an extent in the sense that there are parts or components of his philosophy which are normative, but the whole larger goal in itself cannot be called normative. If you call that normative, then despite Marx's claims that uh, I am doing something scientific, I am trying to achieve something scientific, uh, that also is a normative goal. You know, the idea that communism will happen or we can make communism happen is not very significantly, of course, it is a little different. It's in a different time, in a different kind of a society. But in terms of its ambition, in terms of his, its ambition, it is not at all different from the goal that Plato sets for himself, which is to create an ideal republic where there is great social harmony and there is justice, even though it is mathematically and symmetrically derived. So there isn't anything there which is unrealistic. It's not unrealistic. So the point that I'm trying to make is please understand that uh, everybody then can be seen as just normative. Everybody can be seen as normative. If you say uh, that uh, just because the systems didn't actually come into being, are they normative? I don't think so. So at the level of the ambition of changing society for something else, getting a better society, I don't think there is a great difference between Plato and say Marx. There isn't. And therefore, only at the level of the ambition, huh? please don't go into the details of that and say, but this is not what Plato want. Plato was looking at a segmented society. In fact, uh, our great Indian uh, writers have tried to say that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, that uh, Plato has also created a caste system. Okay, this uh, segmentation of the abdomen, the thorax and the head, the philosopher king, the soldiers and the uh, workers, uh, that the, he said, people say is a caste system that uh, Plato has created and nothing is more nonsensical than that. Plato didn't create a caste system. Uh, the caste system is something that is based in somebody's parentage. Uh, this has nothing to do with the parentage. In fact, he says, people will be brought up, brought up anonymously in as in they are not going to know who their parents are and the parents are not going to know who their children are and they'll all be brought up as the children of the state. So it's pure ability, pure ability uh, that is going to be the determinant of which segment is going to belong to. Madam Shreshta, Madam 
Otros van al bombillo hechos. No, she always comes in with a bang. Anyway, so, so therefore, uh, Plato is not somebody who's being normative because uh, as in the caste system, Plato is setting a goal which is a reachable goal. So why am I saying Aristotle is more normative than Plato is? For that, you have to understand one very important aspect of Aristotelian philosophy. Which is Aristotle is a teleological thinker. This is not something that we derive through uh, some interpretation. This is something that Aristotle himself confesses to. That's not a good word, confess. Confess is always as if, if you've done something bad and you say, yeah, I did it, then that becomes a confession. Now, uh, he himself claims that uh, there is a teleology in his philosophy. There is no doubt about that. So, Aristotle is a teleological thinker. Plato is not a th teleological thinker. And what is a teleological thinker? Uh, or rather, who is a teleological thinker? A thinker who believes, a thinker who believes in um, So what is a telos then? A thinker who believes in a telos, if he is teleological, then what is a telos? A telos A telos is a predetermined goal. Okay, a telos is a predetermined goal, which means that you do not set that goal for yourself. If you decide that I'm going to become a civil servant or an IAS officer, if you set out with that particular goal, then it will be something which is predetermined. And uh, a predetermined uh, goal is 
is somebody else determining it for you. So it is not if I determine a goal for you, that doesn't become a telos. If uh, there is a higher power, if there is a higher power that is determining the goal for you, then that is a T loss. Okay. And Aristotle Okay, Aristotle is one of the most important and crucial philosophers who has uh, um, I think that sentence is wrong. It should be who has talked about. Now, leave it. Uh, the concept of God. What is the Aristotelian concept of God? Now, please remember, if you read his prior and posterior analytics, then you will find that Aristotle is using And when you talk about a cause-effect relationship, I have talked to you about this before, so I won't talk to you about it in great detail now. When you talk about a cause-effect relationship, uh, or you use that uh, to explain the world, then the problem that you have is that um, where does this end in terms of where do you say this whole cause effect sequencing began? The cause effect sequencing has one problem. The problem of this, by that I mean the cause effect sequencing, or is infinite regress. If you go back explaining the cause of one effect then you'll realize that the cause of one effect becomes the effect of another cause. And 
that cause becomes an effect of another cause. All right. So let's do a, that same example that I have given you of a fire in a building. Now that is the effect that you're seeing. If fire broke out in the in a building and you're seeing the fire. So people come, they're trying to put out the fire. And uh, when they are actually putting out the fire, what we do see is that uh, they are looking at the cause for the fire after they put it out. So the effect is the fire. The cause is, let us say, it has been determined as electrical short circuit. Now, the thing is, if you look at uh, the electrical short circuit, now electricity is there in all buildings. Why did that short circuit happen in that building only? So let's say people investigate after putting out the fire. They try to investigate the cause that could have led to the electrical short circuit. Now see, electrical short circuit was the cause for the fire. Now when you're trying to investigate what caused the electrical short circuit, then the electrical short circuit is no longer the cause, it is the effect. So what is the cause that you're looking at? You're looking at a, let's say, the insulation of a wire wiring in the house becoming brittle and because of its becoming brittle, uh, the insulation comes off and two live wires come in contact with each other and that's started the fire. So now you said the cause behind the electrical short circuit is the ins insulation becoming brittle. Why did the insulation become brittle? Then you'll ask yourself this question. How long ago was this wiring done? Somebody says the wiring was done 10 years ago. Now, usually, uh, it is believed that uh, a wiring of a house lasts reasonably comfortably for 25 years. And every 25 years, you have to kind of change the electrical wiring. But here is a situation which is saying that the wiring is only 10 years old. So in the 10 years old, in a 10 year old wiring, you don't expect that you don't expect uh, people to, I mean, sorry, the wire, you don't expect the wire to get brittle in 10 years. So how come this wiring 
got brittle in 10 years. So you investigate into the wiring and you'll say the wiring is of a cheap quality, not good quality. And in order to cut down on the price, the makers of the wires are those who have been the makers of the wires are those uh, who have used substandard material. Well, so that is now the cause. Okay, that is now the cause. And you know what the effect is. All right, so let's try and go back now to see what uh, actually is the reason or the cause for using a cheap wiring. You can say the contractor who built that house wanted to maximize his profits. Okay, the contractor who built that house wanted to maximize his profits. So one of the ways in which he could maximize his profits is by going to this very old wiring. I mean, sorry, very cheap wiring, right? So he put a wire which is not of good quality so that he can continue to make money. So the question then will be, so the contractor wanting to make money is why there is a cheap wiring. So what drove the contractor to this? You can say the budget given to him by the one who wanted the contractor to construct this building by the person who wanted to give uh, uh, set up with the person who set a budget for the construction of the building didn't give too much uh, scope to make uh, a higher level of profit uh, by using quality products then you say that is the reason why the contractor used this cheap quality wiring because he was playing with a limited budget and nobody likes to work uh, without making a certain amount of profit because he has to pay his workers. So therefore he cut corners. So why did the builder say that I'm not going to be able to pay you more than a certain amount. So let me not track this example. So you can keep going back like this. So if you look at the world, and if you want to look at how life came into being, how did it all start? And if you take recourse to a cause, what is wrong with this lady? If you want to take recourse to this cause effect sequencing, then you are stuck with this problem of an infinite regress. There is no beginning. There is no beginning. There is no cause which is a pure cause. By that you mean 
that there is no cause which is a cause and not an effect of something else. That's what it means. Okay? No cause which is purely a cause and not an effect of something else. That is a pure cause. A cause which is not an effect. So, how do you identify this cause? That is where Aristotle uses the concept of God. For Aristotle, So if you ask Aristotle what caused the universe, he would say God caused the universe. And very much like Plato, he also believes that the world in which we live is characterized imperfections. This is very much like Plato. Plato also said the same thing. The world moves because it is imperfect. If it was perfect, it wouldn't have moved. It wouldn't have moved if it was perfect. That it is imperfect is the reason why the world moves. So that is something that we need to understand. That is the thing that we need to have in our minds. Aristotle is saying the same thing. God doesn't move because God is perfect. And that's why he is not an effect. Okay? God for him is a principle. God is not a deity. Actually, we don't even you need to use he on God. He can say it as well, and it doesn't really matter. In fact, that's what people, I never don't know the Greek language. I haven't read Aristotle in Greek, but those who know Greek say that he refers to God as it. Okay, so, uh, so the God caused this universe. The question then God caused this universe, and this universe is full of imperfections. So let's ask ourselves what, let's tell ourselves one more thing. God gives the goal to humans to build a society and life based in
okay god gives the goal to humans to build a society and life based in commodious living or living in harmony this is solidarity among human beings so let's ask ourselves a question now so this is all what this is not what i have told you this is just the beginning of what aristotle has told us it's just the beginning of what aristotle has told us so if we go by this then how did aristotle know all this did he meet god seriously ask yourself this question how did aristotle know all this how did aristotle know that there is a telos which is this of course it's much more than this i'll go into it as we progress is far 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 more than this but even if you take this base level understanding very very base level understanding it is preordained and it's ordained by god how does aristotle know this that becomes a question so if you go back to his prior and posterior analytics he knows this because of his ability to have a priori reasoning what is a priori prior to knowing something prior to its happening and knowing it rationally not something which is like i have a premonition that tomorrow there is going to be an epic tragedy somewhere okay now that is extra sensory perception that doesn't have rationality in it and you say i know i i get a feeling that tomorrow is going to be a very bad day and you see something terrible has happened then you'll say yeah that person's premonition came tr- true so that is not what aristotle has aristotle is saying that this is through a priori reasoning which means there is the involvement of rationality so what is aristotle saying he is saying that rationality can work even before something happens you can use rationality to basically understand something should happen even before that something sh- actually happens 
so what is this if this is not an idea idea in the platonic sense not in our sense of it even in our sense it can be let's say those people who are doing startups they have an idea you know i can build an app into a cell phone which can do xyz and i think people will use it so your reasoning huh it's not arbitrary this app will do something like it will predict the weather based on some kind of things so i'll build an app like that i'll build an app that senses the opposite person's body temperature i build an app that senses the opposite person's uh having a cold or not having a cold having an infection or not having an infection that is what the arogya setu was supposed to be anyway so that is not based in some teapot whimsy it's based in rationality so aristotle also will say that my understanding of god is not a superstitious belief not at all my understanding of god is based in reasoning and what does what kind of reasoning does a priori uh, uh, what does a priori reasoning use it uses an idea so now look at the whole thing now look at the whole construct the whole construct that is in front of you look at what is there on the left of the screen is he an empiricist has he empirically established that there is a god has he empirically established that god wants us to live as in uh, uh, uh live in harmony with solidarity between human beings is that empirically established is that a realistic doctrine a realist doctrine sorry that is not any of those things that is not any of those things now let's come to the next idea in arist oh god the next idea in aristotle that uh, we should know is that aristotle he says that man is a social animal and then he says that is only the beginning the ultimate end 
of the sociability of man is the the goal of the sociable human being is what he calls eudaimonia and eudaimonia happens when man transforms Aristotle says the goal of eudaimonia eudaimonia in greek uh is something that stands for a certain level of enlightened and rational happiness hmm? enlightened and rational happiness and for him when man becomes a political animal then he has reached the highest form of rationality okay he has reached the highest form of rationality he is not looking at man being a a uh, political animal as man turning into a scoundrel which is what george bernard shaw said george bernard shaw said that man transforms into a uh, not transforms he becomes a politician when he has reached his lowest point in ethics the most unethical scoundrel is a politician okay so you have george bernard shaw saying politics is the last refuge of the scoundrel this that is not what aristotle is meaning aristotle's political man or the political animal is an enlightened rational person living in complete harmony with others around him and that is eudaimonia so the predetermined goal the telos that we are talking about in aristotle is eudaimonia that is the telos eudaimonia i have not come to the end of aristotle even remotely by the way just in case you want to know there's a great deal more to discuss there is a great deal more to discuss but i am asking you to consider this eudaimonia isn't this normative can you empirically establish this can you empirically establish god can you empirically establish the teleology i mean that there is a teleology can you empirically establish that 
can you empirically establish that the teleology is the reaching of eudaimonia among other things i have just put that here now uh for a reason and that is to make you understand that aristotle is a very normative thinker very normative thinker much more normative than plato plato is somebody who says don't eat this don't eat that don't listen to music don't read poetry don't watch plays don't watch uh, i mean yeah plays or drama is the same thing so he tells you do's and don'ts based upon his own understanding much later you find somebody like arthur schopenhauer in germany during the german enlightenment and arthur schopenhauer was so taken in with sanskrit that he learned the sanskrit language read the ancient indian wisdom in sanskrit and came to the conclusion came to the conclusion that the individual will will succeed only if it is in consonance with the cosmic will you want to become an ias officer that's your individual will but you will succeed as an ias officer or you will become an ias officer if the cosmic will wants you to become that if the cosmic will doesn't want you to become an ias officer do what you may you will not become an ias officer that's what arthur schopenhauer says and for him that is rational that's how he explains how people fail and how people succeed for him success happens when there is a coincidence between individual will and cosmic will and he exp- explains how that coincidence happens he says the coincidence happens when there is the individual who's willing something has the karma to support that ambition of his or hers only if he has that karma so schopenhauer was a karmic theorist so he said cosmic will will match only if you have the karma if you don't have the karma then you don't have the power the cosmic will will not match yours and he also talks about how to build karma so he talks about gunas characteristics so tatva substance so there is another teleological thinker for you and then there's the great and i really mean great the great hegel who's another teleological thinker but in a different way in a very different way many of the westerners have not been able to understand hegel 
and his teleology because it is simply beyond them. Hegelian teleology, Hegelian thought has a great amount of Eastern mysticism built into it. And Hegel is somebody who redefines even Eastern mysticism. He redefines even Eastern mysticism, unlike Arthur Schopenhauer, who accepted it as accepts it as it is, Hegel doesn't accept Eastern mysticism as it is. He's inspired by it, he makes changes, and he says the world is not about human beings. The purpose of the world is the self-realization of the Geist, written with a capital G. And the usage of the word Geist in Hegel is not like it is in Diltai. Diltai, sorry. The Diltai talks about the Geist as a spirit, which, uh, and he calls the social sciences Geistes Wissenschaften, which have the spirit in them. They deal with spirit, they don't deal with matter. So the definition is far more finer, <clears throat> more distinct <clears throat> in Hegel. Sorry about that. He's another teleological thinker. Suddenly, why did I invoke Hegel and Arthur Schopenhauer? One, because they are teleological. Two, more importantly, they are both classified as idealists. They are both classified as idealists. So now tell me how would you classify Aristotle? Materialist? Realist, empiricist, how will you classify him? It's a serious question. Since he does not subscribe to all aspects that go into making of an ideal uh, thinker and since he is somebody <clears throat> sorry who builds a political system which he calls the best possible he doesn't get tagged as an idealist but there is absolutely no way. There is absolutely no way he can escape the tag of being a normative thinker. He can't escape that. And if he is a normative thinker, then please remember that in terms of his approach, in terms of his approach to philosophy, 
to the understanding of the world. He is not fundamentally different from Plato. He is not fundamentally different from Plato. But Plato is saying, here I am setting the goal for you. Aristotle is saying, no, this goal is set by someone else, God. It's a predetermined goal. And therefore, he is even more normative than Plato. Less idealist, perhaps. Not entirely non-idealist. Less idealist, but more normative. I'll stop here if you have any questions. Because if I start another point, then that's it's going to take some time. <clears throat> uh, sir, the attainment of eudaimonia is completely possible. According to Aristotle, yes. But it has to satisfy. You will understand it better tomorrow. You will understand it much, much better because I have only given you that predetermined goal, which is eudaimonia. Mm -hmm. uh, tomorrow, I'll give you the entire schema. Okay? The entire schema that he puts in front of us uh, to go about attaining eudaimonia. Uh, so, he thinks it is attainable, most definitely. But he doesn't say it's guaranteed. That's why I'm saying he's not a complete idealist. What he says is that though it is a goal that has been preordained, it is finally up to the citizens. And mind you, not people, citizens. It is finally up to the citizens who are different from slaves, from women and all these, it's up to them to attain eudaimonia. So, <clears throat> sorry, I'll explain that in greater detail tomorrow. Yes, sir. Yeah. Akshay, what all wrong things have I said today? Nothing wrong, sir. <laughs> ah, come on. You must have found something wrong. Hmm? Must have found something wrong. I was waiting to be corrected. When is Akshay going to correct me? When is Akshay? Hmm? I have been let down by Akshay today. Completely let down. I'm joking, Akshay. Please don't take me seriously, okay? Okay, sir. Mm. When you need to correct me, please do correct me. I'm serious. Yes, sir. Mm. I'm not making a joke of that. It's just that uh, my classes are so boring. If I don't say something which is a bit lighthearted, I... I guess I don't have such a great sense of humor. So I'll say stupid things in the pursuit of uh, lightheartedness. So, all right then. I think, are there any more questions? No, sir. Okay. Uh, by the way, I realized yesterday evening that I haven't finished Habermas. Uh, I have not done two very important aspects of the hermeneutics. So that I'll be doing today, which is communicative action and uh, universal pragmatics. Okay, so that's again like asterisks. Pragmatics. Yeah. 
okay all right then thank you see you thank you sir yeah okay so thank you thank you yeah. sir. okay thank you thank you sir. thank you